Hi everybody, uh, my name is uh, Christopher Jansman. Thanks uh, very much to the Center for Fiction for having me uh, come here and, uh, and read and uh, Gabe, uh, Gabriel, what Gabe? Uh, Honored to, to read with you today. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, the book and uh, also coming of age stories. Um, my novel, uh, as Kristen just mentioned, is called The Unchangeable Spots of Leopards. Uh, it's a uh, uh, sort of a coming of age story, uh, sort of starts off that way and then goes off in another direction uh, partway through. But uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the coming of age part of the book. Um, and uh, the preface here, I'm just going to try to jump in a little bit in the middle uh, just to save a little time. But um, the, all you need to know, sort of starting out here, the narrator is a, a, sort of a young man. Uh, he's uh, 16 years old, he's working at a, a cafe and an art museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and uh, as the story starts, uh, Billy Littleford is sort of the local hometown hero. Uh, uh, he's been uh, gravely injured by a, uh, a golf club, uh, and um, the narrator who plays on the uh, sort of the high school golf team with, uh, with Billy um, is uh, asked, sort of in a Cinderella moment, to uh, sub in for uh, Billy uh, in taking his sister Bel Betsy Littleford uh, to uh, her debutante ball that night. Uh, so, uh, uh, oh, and the only other thing you need to know is that Betsy Littleford, uh, sort of, you know, one thing that uh, the narrator sort of knows about her uh, is that she never smiles. Uh, it's a big sort of ambition is to one day make her smile. So. All right, here we go. Twenty minutes later, when I saw my reflection in the inside of the elevator doors, I did not even recognize myself. Billy's tuxedo was a little long in the sleeve, but I looked all right. I thought that surely I could impersonate a proper member of the leisure class for two hours. But when the doors parted and I saw Betsy Littleford standing there, my confidence withered like grass in winter. The voluminous lower folds of her white dress flowed from the waist like collapsing waves descending from where the defined V of its northern border intercepted an orbit of tiny pearls. Her hair was down, covering her bare shoulders. A second V was formed by the neat crossing of her gloved hands. A third and final V came in the shape of her sharply plunging eyebrows. Already I'd done something wrong. Come on, she said, grabbing my hand and jerking me towards the ballroom's arched doorway. They started going in four minutes ago. Red velvet curtains covered the high windows that normally illuminated the rotunda. Tall Roman columns supported a great glass dome through which the full moon could be seen yellow and high above us. Briefly, I felt as though I were being led into the Colosseum to be fed to the lions. The room swarmed with older women in scarves and slinky evening gowns and distinguished men in finely tailored tuxedos. The debutantes were there, perhaps 20 girls, white, uh, in the full regalia, white gloves, four-length dresses, and pearls that had belonged to their mother's mothers. They stood in a line, arm in arm, with fathers or brothers. The only guy I recognized was Mark from my golf team who was escorting Suzanne and looking more than a little pale. A man at the podium called the girls' names aloud one at a time, and with each presentation he announced the name of her escort. Each girl then stepped out into a spotlight, curtsied politely, and smiled. Next, she took her escort by the hand and moved on to allow the next young pair to take its place. Betsy's face remained in a total lockdown, but I wondered if I would finally see her smile tonight. Sorry about your brother, I whispered, I whispered weakly. Betsy's face did not change even slightly. Her eyes stared off at nothing at all. Soon a harried little man rushed over to us with Mrs. Littleford in tow. He's right here, I told you, Mrs. Littleford said. Just have Mr. Sherwood say, presenting Elizabeth Littleford, escorted by... Mrs. Littleford looked blankly at me. She did not know my name. He's an old friend of Billy's. This is... And again, she trailed off. Betsy's crescent lips began to form my name, but before she could speak it, I blurted out another name instead. Walter, I lied, thinking of the detective in my Wilkie Collins book. Walter Hartwright. Betsy's eyes bulged ever so slightly, and her lips eased gently back into place. There was no smile, no laugh, just an odd blankness. She wasn't angry, that much I could see. She was amused, I was sure. Only rather than smile, she somehow unsmiled. Then I saw, at last, Betsy's smile was the absence of smiling. As the man ran off to give the speaker my fake name, Betsy pushed her mother's hand aside and said, Walter, when did you and Billy become such good friends again? Acting class in fifth grade, I lied. Vladi uh, Billy was our Vladimir in our production of Waiting for Godot, and I was Estragon. It worked. Betsy unsmiled again. Her mother seemed puzzled. Betsy stepped in suddenly. 
You were in Switzerland with Grandma. And before Mrs. Littleford could question this, the couple ahead of us stepped away, and Betsy dragged me into the light. The audience assumed a solemn silence. May I present Miss Elizabeth Littleford, Mr. Isherwood said, escorted by a close friend of her brother's, Mr. Walter Hartwright. The applause was sudden and electrifying. Betsy curtsied elegantly, but did not smile, not even a little. She took my hand and her gloved one and led me out of the light. After a hundred hands had been shaken and a hundred platitudes exchanged, Betsy drew me to a table where we sat side by side in front of gold inlaid plates and silently consumed Iswa salads and Wagyu steaks while the adults talked of Morningstar ratings, Croatian catamaran chartering, and hunting tundra swans. I watched Betsy closely out of the corner of my eye, making sure I lifted the same utensils that she did. To my fascination, I found this new role was an easier fit than I'd expected. It seemed no one really expected much from the escorts anyway. While the girls got a year of debutante training, the boys seemed to be winging it. I did a damn sight better than Mark, for instance, who sat across from me, using only one fork and dribbling sauce conspicuously down his shirt front. He acknowledged my existence only once, when Mrs. Littleford asked me to tell everyone about Billy's early acting career and addressed me as Walter. Suzanne firmly squeezed Mark's hand as he began to correct her, and he winced in confusion. Before dessert was even served, Mark had vanished to the men's room three times, returning slightly drunker each, after each visit. I didn't blame him. The conversation kept spiraling back to Billy, no matter how much Mrs. Littleford and the others tried to avoid the subject. Early decision notices will come in soon, Suzanne's mother said. Walter, where have you applied? Princeton, I answered quickly. Everyone smiled except Betsy, who unsmiled. Walter's bright future at Princeton grew to involve a position on the golf team and an old friend who'd promised to take me sailing on the Delaware. And then, of course, there'd be writing classes with prize-winning authors. The mothers all approved. I was so engrossed in it all that it wasn't until my water glass was being refilled for the third time that I recognized my co-worker Rodrigo, holding the Waterford pitcher, wearing a staff uniform. Mr. Hartwright, he asked, smirking somewhat, may I refresh your glass? I shifted down in my seat as he poured. Suddenly I felt sure that everyone knew I was full of it, that clearly none of these rich people believed that I was really some well-to-do son of a paper manufacturer just as they didn't believe that Mark was in any way sober, or that Betsy Littleford's father was really away on business, or that her brother was sure to recover in just a few weeks. Time for the waltz, Betsy said, suddenly removing her napkin from her lap. Waltz? Like the waltz waltz? I mumbled, str struggling to stand on my suddenly shaky legs. Rodrigo was trying to help Suzanne get Mark to his feet, and no one was looking at us. I leaned in as close as I dared. I don't know how. The boys are all disasters. Just try to look like you're leading. We stepped out onto the dance floor with the others, and the girls prodded their partners to form a wide circle. The stiff-looking Mr. Isherwood made some sort of announcement regarding a sponsored charity, and there was a crash of music, and Betsy beckoned with her right hand for me to extend my left. I did so, shifting all my weight onto my right foot as she took it. She then drew herself in against me, slightly to my right, so that just half of her pressed up against just half of me. I half passed out. Betsy guided my right hand to the smooth skin below her shoulder blade and placed her right hand into my left and held it out high opposite my neck. And then, through what I can only assume was girl sorcery, she began to move her feet in such a way that my feet knew just where to go. One, two, three, she whispered into my ear, forward, side, together. And then we began to revolve around the floor, like a clock's hands in reverse, spinning around our own axis like two sides of one moon. I had no idea you were an actor, she said. How unexpected. Oh no, I just made all that up, I said quickly, about me and Billy. Exactly, she said. Very funny. But her amusement was silent, just between us. It's very hard to tell with you, I said. She, I smiled. She didn't. We waltzed. Did you know, she said dryly, that the waltz was originally a peasant dance, and that Viennese nobles initially were shocked by the indecency of dancing so closely? I did not know that. Well, you should try taking debutante classes for a year, and I'll peek out of the kitchen window and watch you every Sunday. Before I could decide if she was joking or upset, the song came to its end, and she began to pull away from me. Thanks for filling in, Walter. The mothers were all on their feet as we came back to the table. Mark, somewhat dizzier from all the waltzing, was vomiting semi-raw tuna and well-massaged cow meat all over the table, <laughs> along with about a quart of Jack Daniels. He's hardly slept since Billy's accident, Mrs. White apologized before the flow had ceased. It wasn't your fault, dear. Uh, 
Understandably, the whole incident had put everybody off, and Mrs. Littleford, sensing the evening would go only downhill from here, tapped Betsy on the hand and said, Come, dear, visiting hours will be over at ten, and we're expected back. Walter and I need to say goodbye to the Von Porters, Betsy said, her face showing nothing, no resignation, no urgency. So, I said, thinking, so that was it then, as we walked away in the direction of the Von Porters. But as soon as she had escaped her mother's sight, Betsy began to move quickly towards a set of double doors that led to the sculpture garden. Before I knew it, we were outside. Thick clouds had moved in from the south, covering the full moon like a wash of ink. We spent the whole morning at the hospital, she complained. How's he doing? Not too good, she said. He's got this big hole in the side of his head. Oh, I said, a little surprised by her tone. Was she mad at me? Did she think I had been at least indirectly responsible for Billy's current state? That was a joke, she explained, her blue eyes dancing like fireflies in the dark. Sure, I said. Mystified, I continued to follow her down the gravel paths of the sculpture garden. You want to hear something else funny? We stepped gingerly over little artificial streams, jumping from rock to rock with our shoes in our hands like children. Well, something I think is very funny? All right. He woke up while I was there this morning. He had this breathing tube in, so he couldn't speak until they pulled it out, and then his mouth was real dry, but he kept trying to say something. He pulled it, me in real close, because he could hardly even whisper, and you'll never guess what he said. What? I asked. He goes, who are you? He didn't know who I was. So I say, I'm Betsy, your sister. And he goes, Betsy, I'm gay. I'm gay, Betsy, I'm gay. I nearly slipped off the rocks and into the water. What did you say? I asked. I said, yeah, I know, Billy, I know. <laughs> like I didn't see him making out with our cousin, our neighbor Roger when we were in the eighth grade, but he couldn't remember. Jesus, I mumbled. Betsy went on. He didn't remember who I was, but he remembered that. And my mother is standing there bawling, pretending she didn't hear what he said, and I'm standing there thinking, huh, he finally comes out on the day of my coming out. <laughs> and there it was, another distinct unlaugh, and then, still barefoot, Betsy began to run across a long green field, empty except for us. I was surprised at how fast she was able to run in her gown. I could not see the museum at all anymore, just neat curves of trees along the sloping grass. Betsy kept on running. Not until we came to the top of the hill and I saw a little oasis of sand in the distance did I realize we'd crossed over onto the Briar Creek Creek golf course. She slowed down at last as we crossed onto the eighth hole and sat down on the edge of the bunker. So this is where it happened, she asked. I guess so, I said. The spot where Billy had fallen had been smoothed out into a neat spiral. Not a single bloody grain of sand remained evident in the trap. Nervous, I took my hand and pressed it on top of hers. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was saying. It didn't seem as if there could be anything worth saying. You don't seem that upset, I said finally. It's all just so, she began, and then stopped. Unexpected. Of course. No, I mean, my family, we, well, they, see to it that nothing unexpected ever happens. No grade lower than an A minus, no winter we don't spend in Colorado, no summer we don't go to the Outer Banks. My mother will host the Spring Leukemia Fundraiser, and my father will say he'll be home for our birthday, only something will come up and he'll send a savings bond instead. That's awful. It's not. It's just expected. How could it be awful if it's expected? I guess. Two days ago, Billy was going to go to Chapel Hill like my father, and then Wharton Stern or Harvard, and then take over my father's company someday. Everyone sitting in that ballroom knows that was the plan, just like they all know that I was going to go to a liberal arts college and read some Emily Dickinson and talk about slants of light and join Alpha Gamma Pi and get a degree I'll never use because I'd be married to an econ major I met in my first semester. And then while he'd be at business school, Wharton Stern or Harvard, I'd start popping out babies and choosing window treatments. The expected treatments. The expected babies. She looked up at the wide black sky. But now, I asked. Now, Billy's not going to be the next little fur to go to Chapel Hill. He'll be lucky if he can go to the bathroom. He's not going to go to Wharton or run the company. He can't count to ten. It's terrible, I said. It is terrible, she agreed. So, now you go to Chapel Hill and Wharton and run the company? Is that what you mean? I don't know, she said. I'm going to do, she turned her head to look at me, whatever I want. She relished each syllable. The corners of her lips were just barely curling. And then she lay her head down on my shoulder. Billy told me once she snuck out here at night to practice. Facing, face turning a deep red, I asked, how did he know that? She shrugged. You're the best player on the team and the only one whose dad doesn't drag him out here every Saturday. Billy's not an idiot. Well, he wasn't an idiot. 
Was that another joke? Walter, what kind of a monster did you take me for? She said, batting her eyelashes. I had to ask, how come you never smile? Smile, she repeated my word flatly. That's what they told me in every debutante class for a year of Sundays. Smile, Betsy, smile. It's your job to put everyone else at ease, make them feel welcome. She shrugged, her bare shoulder nudging into mine. My dad's been on a business trip in Dubai since I was 10. My mom's miserable, my brother's gay, and now brain damaged to boot. Put yourself at ease, make yourself feel welcome. I'll smile when there's something worth smiling about. Fair enough, I said, trying hard not to laugh. Billy liked you, she said after a minute. I mean likes you. I mean, if he remembers who you are anymore, he probably still likes you. I think, of all the guys he knew, Billy would have wanted me to go with you. She studied me a moment, and it seemed as though she were about to kiss me, or possibly devour me. It turns out I was right on both counts. First she kissed me, and then came the devouring, the devouring of any hope I ever had of forgetting her, or that night, or Billy, or any of it. for coming. Um, I want to particularly recognize Laura Tisdall, the editor of Unknowns, who's here with us tonight and the secret hero of this book. Not a plot, obviously. I'm trying to read her into the plot, because that would be humiliating. Uh, the book goes back and forth between uh, the chapters from all sorts. Some of them, the narrator, Eric Muller, is a, a young adult in San Francisco, but then in some of them, he is a teenager in uh, suburban Denver, Colorado. Uh, and it is from one of those chapters that I will be reading tonight, because the high school milieu uh, is, of course, central to what we think of as the coming-of-age novel, even though in those chapters he, he completely fails to come of age in any sort of successful way. And in fact, perhaps the whole book is a, a failure to come of age novel more than a coming-of-age novel. And so perhaps I shouldn't be here at all, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, so. The desks in my new homeroom were laid out in a 5 by 5 grid, somewhere on which was located the socially optimal spot. All but three desks were still available. The choices of the first arrivals suggested starkly different intentions. Two girls in ornate sweaters sat front and center, while in the last row a boy reclined his chair against the wall, his eyes shut. I considered joining him in the back row and perhaps mimicking his insouciant posture but that would have drawn too much attention, so I opted for a seat in the classroom's exact center. Pleased with my choice, I settled in, savored the symmetry of rows and columns around me, admired the perfect diagonals that stretched from my seat to each of the corners of the room. At once, my satisfaction spoiled. The midpoint was the most noticeable, the most calculated. I snatched my bag and scrambled to a seat one row back and one column to the left, although no one else had come in yet. I was happy with this innocuous choice, but I feared that the boy with the haircut had seen the switch and perceived my decision-making process at work. In attempting to avoid the appearance of calculation, had I exposed my calculation? I turned back and glanced at him, and our eyes met. By looking, I had given myself away. We sat in silence for at least ten minutes before others began to arrive, many in groups of three or four who had carpooled or arranged to meet outside. I tried to believe that they were as anxious as I was, despite the casual way they picked seats, chatted, called out to one another. This kind of information is inherently distorted. We see ourselves from the outside, all smooth surfaces and fixed appearances. Excuse me. We see others from the outside, all smooth surfaces and fixed appearances, and ourselves from the inside with our subjectivities and histories and bodily fluids. The room's population self-organized into groups of people who had gone to middle school together. The only person I recognized, April Malconian, seemed to have no idea who I was. The year before, she had allegedly let Jason Crawl feel her tits for one minute in exchange for writing her nature diary for biology class. <laughs> On my right, two Asian boys were telling an Asian girl about going to Wet City and how fun it was. <laughs> Wet City was a local water park. The seat to my left was still empty. And then in walked Bill Fleek, 
and before I knew his name, I knew that he was going to sit down next to me and determine the direction of my life for the whole high school and perhaps beyond, and then he did. He was almost freakishly tall for a 14-year-old, with an overbite so intense his jaw seemed to stop halfway to his upper lip. He peered around the classroom, saw the open seat, then he made his way over. He had to kind of fold himself at the waist to fit into the chair, and then he didn't seem to know what to do with his arms. He wound up draping them over the desk. Trying to avoid eye contact, I looked down and fucked with my pencil case, which turned out to be my fatal mistake because it allowed him to see my calculator. Is that the Texas Instruments TI-80, he asked, and I had to acknowledge that it was. I had one of those, he said. Then I got this for my birthday. He handed me his calculator right there in front of everyone. <laughs> I took it as though it were a fish, looked it over quickly, and passed it back to him. I'm Bill Fleet, he said, like an adult. Do you have a computer? <laughs> yeah, I said, hoping no one besides Bill Fleet would hear. The girl in front of me turned around, and I was afraid she was about to call me a loser. She turned out to have a big nose and cheeks that looked padded with cotton wool, but she was a girl. <laughs> to my relief, she addressed Bill Fleet. You shouldn't use a calculator, she said. You'll start to depend on it, and then you'll never be able to do arithmetic without one. Bill Fleek had heard this argument before. <laughs> I carry it with me so I won't need to do arithmetic without one, he said. <laughs> I was horrified, but somehow unsurprised that this conversation was taking place near me, as if I were sending out invisible, contagious nerve rays. <laughs> what if you're on a plane and it crashes on a desert island, the girl asked. I'd have the calculator with me on the plane, wouldn't I, said Bill Fleek. You might forget to pack it, said the girl, or the battery might run out. I'd carry extra batteries with me if I was going on a plane, said Bill Fleek. He spoke in a breathless, hyper-articulated way, as if his lips and tongue were struggling to keep up with the words. It doesn't matter how many batteries you have, she said. They're going to run out eventually, and then you won't be able to do math. I couldn't stop myself. Why would he need to do math if he's stuck on a desert island, I said. It came out too loud, and the Asian guy to my right turned to see what was going on. I might need to calculate the angle for a lean-to, Bill Fleet said. I might need to do long division to figure out how to divide up the food among the people who were on the island with me. He might need to calculate where to put up a sundial, said the girl. I wouldn't need a sundial, said Bill Fleet, extending his wrist to display a chunky digital watch. You shouldn't wear a digital watch, the girl said. You'll forget how to tell time. Mercifully, the teacher walked in. All right, you guys, she said, louder than the situation had warranted, since we quieted down as soon as she walked in. She called roll, and I got that slight nervous feeling you get the first time they call roll, and you don't know who's before you in the alphabet, and you're afraid you're going to miss your name or answer too emphatically, or you won't be on the list at all. But she read my name, and I answered fine, and I experienced the tiny sensation of pride and belonging that you get after they call roll for the first time. As we headed out for the first day assembly, I surveyed the kids in front of me and realized that none of them had ever seen me before. I felt a strange excitement building, the kind stowaways must feel as they watched the coastline recede. My identity was up for grabs. We were the last homeroom to arrive in the auditorium. The student body was catching up after summer vacation, saying, oh my god, and how's it going to the kids next to them, behind them, several rows away. As I looked down at the crowd, I was staggered and overwhelmed by the endless varieties of girls. Girls who were going for cute, and girls who were going for sexy, and girls who were going for normal. Soccer players in shorts and sweatshirts, and future English majors in long Laura Ashley skirts. Girls with big breasts who were trying to hide them, and girls with big breasts who were trying to show them off. Christian girls in button-down sweaters, and nerd girls in overalls, and rocker girls in black t-shirts with elaborate heavy metal iconography. Groups of pretty girls, groups of almost pretty girls, ugly girls in ones and twos. It was an impossibly rich and complex zoology. I froze momentarily, and the people flooding in behind me pushed me forward, and I stumbled and nearly fell. Excellent.